like emerging markets. Look at what's happening recently in Greece or other parts of the Eurozone. So there's been this dual global economic recovery, anemic, more like a U in advanced economies, more like a V until recently in emerging markets. That's one of the many ways in which the world has changed. Now, let me talk briefly about uh, uh, one, the, those five tail risks uh, in the global economy. First one, as I pointed out, is the Eurozone. Now, we could spend hours, of course, talking about the Eurozone crisis or a particular country like Greece. I'm going to be relatively brief. I'm going to talk about some of the negatives, some of the positives, and what needs to be done. The negatives are the following. There is an economic recession in the periphery of the Eurozone. Unfortunately, this economic recession is becoming worse as you have fiscal austerity that in the short run, however necessary, reduces growth. You're raising taxes, you're cutting spending, you're cutting transfer payments. You need to do it, but it's recessionary. And also the banking problem and the credit crunch implies less borrowing, less ability to finance economic activity. This recession in the periphery of the Eurozone today is starting to spread to the core. The latest data from France suggests the beginning of a recession. Germany is slowing down. So, of course, trade link implied that if Italy, Spain, Greece, Ireland, Portugal are in a recession, and these are major markets for Germany, even Germany is going to slow down. So, we have a recession. We have a process of disintegration and fragmentation and balkanization of the banking system. Look at the banks in the Eurozone. There is not a common banking system anymore. Cross-border money is gone. Interbank money is gone. Wholesale funding is gone. Uh, smart money of rich people and of corporates is also leaving the periphery. So the banks are becoming balkanized. And we have a process also of balkanization of public debt markets because foreign investors are leaving not just the banks and the non-financial corporates in the periphery of the Eurozone, but they're also dumping their holdings of public debt. So more of the public debt is becoming domesticated and in the hands of the banking system, worsening the vicious circle between the banks and the sovereign. So you have economic balkanization and disintegration and contraction. You have uh, banking and financial balkanization, and we have public debt markets balkanization. So people talk about the breakup of the Eurozone, whether it's going to occur, but in economics, in banking, financial market, in public debt, that kind of disintegration is already dangerous and ongoing. Really, the Eurozone is becoming balkanized in economic, banking, fiscal, and financial affairs. So we have to stop it, and we have to reverse it. Now, what are the positives? The positive, I think, in the last three months are the following two. The first one is that the policymakers in the Eurozone have realized that the monetary union alone is not viable. For a monetary union to be viable, you also need a banking union, you need a fiscal union, you have, need an economic union that restores growth and competitiveness, and eventually you also need more of a political union. Why? If you're going to give up national sovereignty on banking, fiscal, and economic affairs from your nation states to the center, Brussels, the EU, then you have to provide political legitimacy for that transfer of power. Otherwise, you're not going to have political legitimacy. So the end result of a greater union is monetary union with a banking union, with a fiscal union, with an economic union, with a greater also political union. You might not get a full federal state, but you need certainly a process even of political reform that gives uh, more power to the center in a way that is democratic legitimacy. And the positive is that now there are proposals on the table for a banking union, for a fiscal union, for a growth compact, and eventually even for political integration. Uh, the second positive is that you need official financing to allow countries that are in trouble and there are seven countries today in trouble, Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Italy, Spain, Slovenia, and Cyprus, to different degree, they're in trouble. They have to do reform, they have to do adjustment, they have to do austerity, but as the money is flowing out of their country, there's capital flight, and you have to finance uh, flow deficits, current account and fiscal, you need financing. And the private sector is not willing to provide that financing to the governments and the countries, so you need the official sector the EU, the ECB, 
the IMF and others to provide that financing. The positive is that right now, in the recent decision of the European Central Bank, now the European Central Bank is in play. It realizes that the firewall provided by the EFSF or even the SM or IMF is too small given the financial pressures on many countries and therefore the only agent that has enough firepower to be able to backstop credibly governments and banks is the central bank. And now there is greater willingness to backstop not just private banks but also governments that are following sound economic policies. 50 minutes, which means 10 minutes left. Okay. <coughs> Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> so there is now uh, ECB also being in play. So those are the positive. The negatives again is that achieving the banking union, the fiscal, the economic, the political is going to be very hard on each one of these issues that are disagreement. And secondly, that you have to restore also economic growth. I don't think that restoring economic growth is enough on the agenda of the policymaker of the Eurozone. Because if you don't have economic growth, eventually the social and political backlash against austerity is going to become overwhelming. And secondly, you're trying to stabilize debt and deficits as a share of GDP. If the denominator of that ratio, GDP, keeps on falling, your debt ratio are going to still rising. However things you do on the deficit, then you're going to still look insolvent. So people are willing to tighten their belts, to sacrifice, but they need to see light at the end of the tunnel. By next year, we have to have economic growth, we have to have job creation, we have to have income creation. Otherwise, it's going to become the austerity fatigue is going to become extreme. And I don't think that yet the policymaker Eurozone are emphasizing the role for growth. For example, we need to have more infrastructure spending in many parts of the Eurozone. In Italy, even in Germany, there are not enough infrastructure. And those infrastructure should be financed with common funds that are coming from the EU because national governments are cash-strapped. So you have to think creatively about the things that are going to create jobs and income and opportunity and jumpstart economic growth. I don't think those things are emphasized. Let me talk briefly, given the time is left, about the other downside risks. U.S. is growing as opposed to the Eurozone, but U.S. economic growth is very weak, 1.5% this year. And next year, there will be a fiscal cliff. Some taxes are going to be increased. Some spending is going to be cut. It's not going to be a cliff. Maybe it's going to be just a bump if there is a political agreement. But suppose there is a fiscal drag of 1% of GDP, likely. If the economy is growing 35 and you have a drag of 1% for a year, you're going 25 and you're still okay. But if the economy year-end grows only 15 and you impose a fiscal drag next year of 1%, you end up close to 0% growth, close to a double-dip recession. So that's a risk, that the fiscal contraction of the U.S. is going to be more severe and it's going to lead to a double-dip recession even in the United States. Third risk in the global economy. China has been growing 10% per year for the last 30 years. It's now the second largest economy in the world. That's a positive. However, the economic growth model of China, as even their own premier suggests, is not sustainable. It's uncoordinated. It's unsustainable. In China, there is too much reliance on exports, too much reliance on fixed investment, from real estate to infrastructure to too much capital spending, too much savings, not enough private consumption. So the Chinese have to, with the new leadership they're going to choose at the end of the year, they know they have to reorient their growth model to make it more sustainable. They have to reduce investment, reduce savings, and increase consumption. That takes a lot of economic reform. If these economic reforms are made, China is going to have a soft landing. The risk, however, is that the bust of investment from real estate to infrastructure is already occurring, and the economic reform that lead to more consumption and less saving in China are occurring, unfortunately, too slow relative to what is optimal and desirable. I'm not predicting a hard landing of China, but saying that you have to reorient and rebalance this growth rate to avoid that. Otherwise, there is a risk of a hard landing in China.